The wildfires in Australia are really worth mentioning. The devastation that's there far exceeds what we've experienced in California, far exceeds what uh, the Amazon rainforests have been through. And I just, I put a question up there, you know, could this be a preview and a forewarning of coming judgment? The judgment that's coming upon this earth because it's easy to lapse into the worldly mindset of, well, things will just continue the way that they are and nothing will really change. And, you know, if, if, it, if it hasn't happened by now, it's not about to happen. You, the Lord will come as a thief in the night when we least expect. And I, you know, I keep my ears pretty close to what the Christian news media is talking about, what other ministries are talking about. And I'm not saying that I'm not putting myself up on a pedestal in any way, but I've heard nobody else talk about the fact, could this be a forewarning of what's coming? You know, could this be a preview to wake people up and say judgment is coming, get right with God, because one day judgment is coming and you and nobody else will be able to stop what's going to come upon this earth. In there, in Australia, we need to be praying for them. 25.5 million acres have burned since September 2019. It's been burning since September 2019, and they're saying that it will continue for several more months. Consider these numbers. 2.2 million acres were burned in 2019 in the Amazon rainforest wildfires. And you remember what that was like. People were saying, oh, our oxygen is going, it's leaving, it's... Consider, look at those numbers. 2.2 million compared to 25 million. And then 2, 2 million acres were burned in 2018 here in our country in the California wildfires. Fires. It just puts some perspective on it. Temperatures in December in Australia hit 104 to 105 degrees, and January and February are their hottest months. And so they're bracing for even hotter temperatures. That heat is like an oven that just incubates the fires. And if the fire doesn't get you, the smoke, all of that carbon monoxide, can overcome a person, render them unconscious, and suffocate them in minutes, I was reading. So the smoke itself is very, very dangerous. An average person can run at 6.1 miles per hour. Not necessarily anybody in this room, but supposedly, <laughs> Helen might be able to run at 6 miles per hour, but uh, I don't think any of the rest of us can. But the, just to put it in perspective, a forest fire like we have out in California, they spread at 6.7 miles per hour. A bush fire, which is what Australia is going through, spreads at 14 miles per hour. You know what that means? You're not coming out alive. Yeah, that you're, you're going to be overtaken. 27 people have died. 480 million animals have died. Can you imagine that? Wow. Over 1 billion animals have been affected, either burned, injured, relocated, forced out of their natural habitat. There's a picture from above. Just some pictures to show the devastation. You know, there was uh, at least one town, probably more towns, they were going down to the beach to escape, trying to leave on, on water. Look at that poor little guy. Black singed ears. I don't know about him. This guy looks like, you know, I could get kind of used to this. But you know, the burns to his legs have to hurt. Just really tragic. And you see there, uh, the earth is just scorched where these fires have burned so hot. But it really, it reminds me at least of 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. And see, people don't think past the temporal, not even Christians. A whole big problem with the church today is we, we live so much for now and we live so much for this earth and we don't remember there's a heaven coming. There is judgment coming. There's a better day coming. There's, this is not our home. We're just passing through. And that sense is just not in Christian thinking today. 
But verse 10 says, The day of the Lord will come like a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Maybe this is a forewarning. Verse 11, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, remember what sort of people you ought to be in lives of holiness and godliness. Are you obeying more and sinning less? Is the trajectory of your life committed to Jesus Christ? Are you drawing closer to Him this year than you did last year? Are you seeking Him earnestly in prayer and in His Word? Is holiness a part of your life? We are to be waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God. Not to be all overwhelmed and involved in trying to save this earth. We're to be waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God. That's what we are to be preparing for. Laying up treasures in heaven, not laying up treasures on the earth. Maybe that's why we don't hear about this in Christian circles today. Because people are earth dwellers. They have no vision or hope in heaven. Because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That is what we're waiting for. That's what we're longing for. And it all comes down to your relationship with Jesus. When you're really in love with someone, a long-distance phone call doesn't cut it. You, got it. you want to see them face to face. You want to feel them. You want to hold them. You want to be held, right? And so really the issue is people are using Christianity to better their lives and to advance them in this world, but they don't have any love for the Savior himself. And so there's not the longing of the heart to be with him. Remember this guy? We talked about this a little bit last week. I think it was last week. And I remember I showed you that article or that headline from last week that there's a lot of people saying, well, how should Christians respond? And what should Christians think about this? And, you know, President Trump singling out this man and assassinating him. And, you know, is, is that right? Is that the Christian thing to do? Well, that's a pretty good question. But last week, uh, I can't really remember what we talked about last week, but last week I, we talked about the fact that there's in the Bible there's one and only one solution for evil. And you have to remember that. And I think one thing that you have to remember is there's a big difference between evil people and sinners. And listen to me. Evil people don't repent. They're stiff-necked, proud, stubborn. Sinners repent. And that's the whole reason why God chose Israel over the other nations because he knew there were time, they were thick-headed, man, and there were times it took a lot of chastening, but they would repent. They would get the message after a while. But you have someone like Pharaoh or others with a hard heart. That's why, you know, that's why I emphasize repentance so much. The only thing right now between you and the fires of hell is your repentance, that you are sorry for your sins. And I'm not excluding Jesus and the cross and all of that. I'm just saying, whatever lies in you, whether you go to heaven or hell, you, you better be repentant until the day you die. And me too. But as far as the other nations go, remember what we saw last week about how God dealt with evil nations. Deuteronomy 7 verse 2. When the Lord your God gives them over to you, this is when Israel was going to go into the promised land and drive out the nations. He says, you defeat them. You must devote them to complete destruction. Remember, there are other verses where you killed man, woman, child, dog, cat, sheep, donkey. You shall make no covenant with them and show no mercy to them. And we talked a little bit last week about how, you know, this is one stopping point for a lot of people because they say, I can't, I can't love a God who doesn't love. I can't love a God who would destroy all these people. 
And then you go to the other perversion of some churches that say, well, you know, in the Old Testament, the Old Testament God was a really angry God. But the New Testament God is a really loving God. Dude, same God, both books. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so when we read these verses, there are a lot that we can learn about the nature of our God. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 16. But in the cities of these peoples that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance, you shall save alive nothing that breathes, but you shall devote them to complete destruction. Now, I think, I, I think we also showed you verses, maybe, last week, where there were tribes that did not do this. How many of you are aware some of the tribes kept people alive and they didn't destroy every living thing that has breath? And what did God say would happen? I don't know if I put this in there or not. No, I didn't. What did God say would happen if they left any of these nations alive? And we're talking about specifically the Canaanites. He said they would become thorns in your side and what in your eyes? Briars or something like that? In other words, if you don't kill evil, it's going to keep coming back again and again, and you're going to be sorry you didn't take them out when you had the chance. That's what God was saying. And so, you know, when we deal with a guy like this, and dear heart, Pelosi still makes me furious when she says, uh, you know, this was, how do they say, this, this was just so disproportionate. So what she is saying is this man's life is more important than the six to seven hundred servicemen who died because of him, because of the thousands of other lives that remain crippled because of him. This man was evil. And there is one and only one solution for evil, and God demonstrated it through his people in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 5. And he's speaking to Israel. It's not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart that you are going in to possess their land. In other words, he's telling Israel, look guys, it's not because you're so special. It's not because you're so holy. He says in another place, it's not because you, you are so numerous or so strong because you're not. But because of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God is driving them out. So in other words they would fall under the evil category, not the sinner category. And there's one and only one solution for evil in the scriptures. And I, you know, anyway. Beautiful, beautiful thing there, isn't it? And I say that taking someone's life and violence in and of itself is not beautiful. That's not what I'm commending at all. But I am, I think it's pretty awesome that we live in a nation whose military can thread a needle and pinpoint a car that accurately. I mean, that's just an awesome thing. I got several things racing through my mind, but I'm going to go on. This I thought was, was very, very sad. They went around and they interviewed some college students. And you see there in the headline, college students express their devastation over General Soleimani's death. They said this really requires an apology. They obviously have never taken a field trip to Iraq or Iran or Syria. Or One said, I was shocked and kind of immediately disgusted that Trump had done that. It was very devastating for me. The United States has a history of violence against non-white people. How that fits in, I have no idea. We're a bunch of white supremacists. These are, these are actual comments from college people. I think that most decisions that the US government makes are based on their allegiance to white supremacy. Yeah, that was it. The American people are not innocent. I don't think the U.S. should have a hitman type of presence. I couldn't believe this. Even Erin Burnett, this is what she said on the air. Iranians who chant death to America 
don't seem to mean it. I slept so well last night because, you know, when they say death to America, they don't really mean it. After all, she was there and she heard them, so she should know. You know what, but you know what this is with both the college students and with her? And they think, oh, you, you, you targeted and you assassinated this guy, and that is so harsh and cruel, and why are you being so violent? They are denying that evil exists. And they are denying that the judgment of God falls on the evil. And they are denying that there is some worth and value in an evil person. That's, what, that's what's going on here. And it's all based on this subjective right and wrong where there are no absolutes, but you know, it's kind of just, we just need to understand them better. Maybe if we talk to them. <laughs> Don't turn around, there will be a knife in your back. And so it's this, it's this uh, humanistic relative truth of we just all need to get along. It doesn't work with evil people. Evil people will not let you get along. If you let them live, they will keep coming back again and again. And so, and I don't think that President Trump, I, I don't know, so I don't, I'm not trying to claim that he was making his decision based upon scripture. Maybe he was, I don't know, but I'm just saying what he did as far as God's battle strategy was the right thing to do. Absolutely. And then Iran's weak retaliation. There, you know, there was news coverage. They were, they were wondering, Iran should have been able to hit targets a lot better than this. You know, you heard people on the news say that. And why was it such a, a weak retaliation? And how did our, didn't it seem strange to you that our servicemen knew two hours in advance that this attack was coming? Now, thank God they did. And so they got into the bunkers and not one lost, not one life was lost. So thank God for that. But it just seemed really strange, you know. This, this man that was, that wrote this article says this, Iran's response to the killing of Major General Soleimani was to put on a light show over several U.S. bases in Iraq. Now, you know, it did do some damage and destroyed a couple buildings, I think. It was just enough to show the people of Iran and the world that the regime was serious about responding to the attack, but benign enough to signal to the United States that they were standing down. And so I put there as the question, maybe George Washington was right after all. To be prepared for war is one of the most effective means of preserving peace because they don't want to make you mad. Ronald Reagan also said, we maintain the peace through our strength. Weakness only invites aggression. Last week we looked at, I think, one of the scriptures where oh, it was like, it was about Rahab the harlot, if you remember, where uh, she was hiding the spies that came from Israel, and she told the spies, when we heard what you guys did, to Jericho, how you came in, our hearts melted. We were afraid. Now, you can, be, you can have the mis misconception of, well, that doesn't sound very Christian. I mean, we don't want people to be afraid of us. As a nation, we sure do, because there are evil people out there, and they will keep attacking us again and again and again until we make them afraid of us. That's how you deal with evil people. That's how God in the Old Testament deal, dealt with evil people. And so thank God that this move was made. And then a few days pass. And remember, there was a kind of an uproar that, oh, President Trump did such a bad thing, and now it's going to be worse, and now we're less safe than ever before, and we're going to be attacked, and he's going to start a war. And then that plane goes down. And you know, as soon as that plane went down, I heard about it, I thought, that is just, something's going on here. I don't know how it affected you. And I don't mean 
something going on in terms of an Iranian strategy or anything like that. But I just thought this, this is going to, I, when it happened, I thought this is going to be key to this whole scenario. And so at first, the Iranians were saying it is scientifically impossible for this flight to have been shot down with a missile. Scientific. I, I want to know who their scientists were because they need to go back to school. Iran continues to maintain that its missile defense system is not to blame. An Iranian official said Thursday that it was scientifically impossible for one of their defense missiles, that one of their defense missiles struck the plane because of its altitude and the fact that blah, 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 blah. Well, then in the midst of this, this fellow, Justin Bronk, who's a research fellow at the British Defense Think Tank, tweeted, if these allegations are true, because then it started to come out, we think the Iranians shot this plane down. And he said, if these allegations are true, it hadn't been uh, verified yet, it shows staggering incompetence and carelessness to mistakenly fire at a commercial jet. You know, Iran, Iran, maybe you better go back to throwing rocks. You can't handle these weapons, obviously. Staggering incompetence and carelessness. And all 176 people were on board. And then, I think it was just yesterday, this came out. Iran admits to the unintentional, you know, it's scientifically impossible. Yeah, we did it. Iran admits to unintentionally shooting down the Ukrainian plane. Of course, they blamed it on America. Uh, that was interesting. But the, uh, the Iranian president tweeted out, investigations continue to identify and prosecute this great tragedy and unforgivable mistake. And the reason why I put up there God's sovereign throttle, because we were talking a little bit how God works through the nations and how he controls nations. And I'm not saying, you know, this absolutely positively, but I'm thinking, I'm just asking the question, could it be that the, the downing of this airplane was God's sovereign throttle controlling this situation? Because at first, the Iranians were the victims. They were the underdog being attacked by this evil America. And with the downing of that plane, and don't mistake what I'm saying, every one of those 176 lives are precious before God, and he wants none of them to perish. But can you see how the downing of this plane changed the playing field completely? And Iran went from being the victim and the underdog, trying to defend itself against these aggressive, evil Americans, and now they're on the defensive, looking very incompetent, very embarrassed. It changed the dynamics of the whole situation. And remember last week, we saw that verse where it says that God has a purpose for everything, even the evil in the day of trouble. And even in something like this, God has a purpose. And what if President Trump did something right as God would have done it? And he destroyed the evil. And now God is preserving us by this turn of events. And now uh, Iran is on the defensive trying to defend themselves in the court of public opinion. And they're too weak right now to attack back. This is where they tried to blame it on America. Based on preliminary conclusion by the armed forces, human error at time of crisis caused by U.S. adventurism. Oh, it was our fault after all. <laughs> it's amazing how it always comes back on us. And now, did you see this on the news? I don't, either on the TV or look at all these people. Protesters in Iran call for Khomeini to step down. <laughs> this poor guy has had a bad week. And the Lord is doing great things, but can you, I can just see the hand of God just weaving these events. 
and turning the tide against our enemy. And thank God for President Trump making the decision that he made. Supposedly, you never know how much you can believe uh, on the news nowadays, but supposedly there were many people in the room that disagreed with his decision, some of his advisors, but he went ahead and made it anyway. And the way things are turning out, it does appear that God is favoring the decision. And then tonight, I'd, I'd like to show this video tonight. It's 22 minutes and 48 seconds. This guy is Steve Huff. He's the president of Ac Accuracy X. And the reason why I, I really like his presentation, because he's calm, he's sober, uh, he's a very good communicator. What he does is he discusses the three bills that the Virginia Senate are trying to get passed right now relating to gun control. And he, he uh, very clearly summarizes what those three bills could mean to the Virginian resident. And so I, and in, in light of this, uh, you know, yesterday, uh, Sal and I went up and we kind of spent the morning with uh, Rick up in um, Edinburgh. We went to this auction in Edinburgh from, uh, you know, from the nation's capital, Northern Virginia, to a Shenandoah Valley auction, there's a little bit of a culture shock. It's kind of like going through a time warp of some strange kind. You can just imagine. But it was great. We had a good time. I, a lot of my time was spent reading people's t-shirts. They had some great t-shirts. Have you ever been in a situation? I wanted to take out my cell phone and start snapping pictures, but I thought that might be a little weird. But uh, so it's one of those situations where there are just, you know, so many T-shirts in one place, you just couldn't take enough pictures. So, but anyway, one person had just two words, whiskey helps. <laughs> Didn't say what it helps, but I thought, now I'm sure that he's thinking, you know, it can be a good antiseptic if you get a bad cut or... Right? Surely that's what he was thinking, right? The other one said, um, he said, uh, don't hate me just because I'm a gun toter. Gun toters have sensitive feelings too. And then the other one was, uh, oh, the other one relating to this was, uh, it said, there is no First Amendment without a Second Amendment. And if you think about it, you know, the First Amendment is what? Freedom of the press, freedom to assemble, freedom of the speech, and freedom of religion. I think it's, am I missing one? Or I think it's those four things. And so that's kind of why I want to show you this tonight because I felt like that t-shirt hit it right on the head. Some of the greatest wisdom you can find on a t-shirt. Depends on where you are and who the people are that are wearing them. I like to read what's on the t-shirt and then try to figure out what makes their mind think that way. The guy with the whiskey shirt, I think we know where his mind was. But, so, uh, but anyway, it, it was a, you know, the statement was, uh, there is no First Amendment without a Second Amendment. And if you take time to read the Federalist's papers, the, uh, it's very important that you do because the Bill of Rights and the Constitution is just bare bone statements. And it doesn't give any of the reasoning or the context of why this statement was being made. And so it's kind of like the Bible. If you don't study it in the context and the history when it was written, you lose a lot of the meaning. But in the Federalist Papers, it makes it very clear, uh, without the right to defend yourself and defend your family, your freedom of religion, your freedom of press, and your freedom of speech is, is going right out the window. And so the two are very much linked together. And so even with this, even though I think it's important enough to show you this video so that you as a Virginian resident know what's going on, my real concern is beyond the, gov govern the, the gun control and it's on what will they do next. You know, and I know we can fall into the trap of thinking, ah, it will never happen here. America will rebound. And 
I just, when, when I hear that or when I th- am tempted to think that way, I do re- remind myself of Germany in World War II. I mean, the Germans, as far as their engin- engineering and technology, are, I mean, they're one of the smartest countries on the planet. And if they could be, if they could be so deluded by Adolf Hitler and rally behind him and believe that they were receiving the truth, It can happen here. And what we see happening and what he'll talk about tonight is exactly the very thing that our forefathers feared. And it's exact what's happening is is exactly why they wrote the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And so I think it's very important because uh, did you know in China right now, to be a member of their church, to be a member of a church in China. You have to be fingerprinted, photographed. Uh, To give more of the context, there is only one state church that you are permitted to attend. Anything like a Christian fellowship like this is outlawed, and they they do hunt them down and find out where they are secretly meeting. But there is an official church that's more of a quasi- uh, you know, new age type of, really strange. And so you're permitted to attend that state-sanctioned church, but even if you attend their own church, you still have to be photographed, fingerprinted. I think they even have eye, you know, the, the eye scans. Plus, the government has installed, are going through and installing cameras in every one of those sanctioned churches. I, it's crazy. So you're going to sanction this church, but people are still under such scrutiny? Now that's an extreme, and I know that's an extreme, and I know that we are nowhere close to that. But could it get there? That's why understanding these things and how they relate to our freedoms and to our Christianity, I think, is very important. And so... I'm not in any way advocating that we become political or social activists. I just want us to be informed. That's all I want. You have to make the decision how involved or uninvolved you are. But I think it is important enough to bring up in in where we live and and what we're doing. We were talking a little bit about it at lunch, and you know, Rick made the very true statement. We here in Virginia, we have a Democratic Senate, a Democratic Congress or whatever they call it. What do they call it on the state level? Is it still a Congress? Yeah. So we have a Democratic legislature. That's a good word. Thank you. And uh, it's pretty obvious what the vote's going to be. I mean, it's going to pass. And so that means you and I will have decisions. Will, will they come to each home and confiscate our guns? I highly doubt it. I They don't have the manpower or the money to do that. It's just, and like Rick was saying, you know, maybe in four to eight years or however long it takes, we'll elect some Republican who will come over and overturn all the laws. It it could go that way. But uh, right now we are at very serious crossroads where our constitutional foundation is being violated at every turn. And when you start taking away or outlawing the right of a person to defend himself and his family, you're targeting really the last straw to be able to take away all of their other rights. And so you'll hear, and again, I like this guy because there's no hype. He's very conservative. He's very much to the point. He... He doesn't overstate anything. He just states everything very factually. So we'll play that tonight. But we've been talking about how do we live in peace in this crazy world. I mean, we just saw some photos and looked at some statistics that could really put your heart in fear, right? And Jesus promised, I'm going to give you peace, but it's not the peace that the world gives. Peace is not the absence of trouble. Peace is not the absence of fear. 
Peace is a peace that God gives you deep inside your soul that causes you to sing along with the, with the hymn writer, it is well with my soul. Even though everything in life is going down the toilet, it's well with me. It's like Augustine, I think it was Augustine, no, it wasn't Augustine, it was Justin Martyr who said, you may be able to kill me, but you can't destroy me. You can kill my body, but you can't kill my soul. And so it's that lasting, settled, deep peace of knowing that I am right with God and I am in His hands and He is in control of everything that I can't control, and so I trust Him completely. And we said, first of all, that peace comes from the cross of Jesus Christ. If you're not right with God, then there's nothing right in your whole life. And you won't know what true peace really is until you are right with your creator, your master, your judge. We said, secondly, there is no peace without repentance. Until you come to God with a sorrowful heart and confess your sins to him, you have no assurance that your sins are forgiven. He says to confess your sins. And God, who is faithful and just, will forgive you of your sins. David here in Psalms 32 said, remember he said, I had no peace. My bones were drying up. But when I acknowledged my sin to you, when I did not cover my iniquity, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Then God forgave me and I knew he forgave me and I had peace. That repentance, the confession of sin is so necessary. You won't have any peace without understanding how much God loves you. Because 1 John makes it very clear, there's great torment in fear. There's the torment of God doesn't love me. He's going to reject me. I've sinned once too many times and now I'm under his judgment. And listen, if you have a sorrowful, repentant heart, it is impossible for you to sin too many times. Now, I'm not saying go out and sin, but I'm saying if you are truly sorry for your sins and you confess them before the Lord, you won't want to sin more. You will want to sin less. And as long as you have that godly sorrow, he will always forgive you. You have that assurance. Realize how much God loves you that he would send his only son to die in your place. Now, some of us might give up our firstborn, but it wouldn't be with the same pure motives, right? But he gave his only begotten son to die such a torture on the cross. He rejoices over you. Realize the love that God has for you and receive it. And then we talked about number four. This is, you know, we, I entitled this Seven Ways to Peace. Number four is realizing God's sovereignty. That great quote from Spurgeon that sovereignty is the pillow upon which you lay your head every night. That's what gives you the peace. And we talked about in the headlines about how God does this very thing in Daniel chapter 4, verse 35. He does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And so when you're in the middle of a problem that's out of your control, you can safely trust in your heavenly Father because he is in control. All things are possible to him. We talked about Jesus being asleep in the boat in the midst of a storm. Do you think you would be asleep in that boat? Are you asleep in your boat now? How, how much of a reality... Is sovereignty to you? Is that your reality? That God is in control? That he orders my steps? That even though I fall, he picks me up because he holds me in his hand? Is that reality to you? Or are the wind and the waves stronger in your mind than God? You've got to meditate. You've got to pray. It's got to become your reality that God is in control of my life. And yes, I could sleep in a sinking ship. We talked about the fact that, you know, the first thing that goes bonkers is our mind. Our mind just can take us to bad places. And we assume the worst. Most of us do. 
There may be a few optimists out there, but Proverbs 28, verse 26, whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool. And so we talked about when you're in the middle of circumstances and you can't figure out why, what's going on, what's going to happen next, shut your mind off. You can't figure it out if you trust in your own perception. How many of you have ever thought something was a certain way and according to your perception, that's how you saw it, only to find out that it was completely wrong? We've all experienced that, right? Don't trust in your own mind, your own perception. You'll be found a fool if you do. The less you understand, the less you should try to understand. Just leave it with God. And we'll talk about that probably next week when we talk about prayer. We talked about knowing the depth and the degree of God's involvement in your life, that every hair on your head is not just counted, but it's numbered. (laughs) Every hair is numbered. You know, if if you shave like I do, man... You've got hairs in certain places that just keep growing back and you shave it every day and tomorrow morning it's going to be right back. And that obnoxious hair has a number in the love of your God. That's how involved He is in your life. You have His full attention. And a sparrow doesn't even fall to the ground apart from your Father. I love the way that's phrased there. Not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your Father. What are you going through right now? Do you realize whatever it is that you're going through, you are not apart from your Father? He's right there with you. You can rest easy in that. But then some of the verses we didn't get to. Remember Romans 8.28? We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. I titled that up there, what you gain and what you lose is eternally greater. Because that's really the fear, right? Well, what am I going to lose? How is this going to affect me? Am I going to lose my health? Am I going to lose my money? Am I going to lose my home? Am I, you know, what am I going to lose? Am I going to lose my job? And what Romans 8.28 promises is this. No matter what you lose, what God gives you in the process is far greater than what you lose. Always. You have that promise. And so we get so fearful of change and how is this going to affect me or make things harder on me. Let me tell you something. It's better on the other side. Just go through the process and trust God. Because what you gain and what you lose is really is eternally greater. The person who spoke to this was Paul in Philippians chapter 3, verse 4. He said, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh, I have a lot of confidence in my flesh. Why? Because I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Man, I studied. I did everything just right. As to the law of Pharisee, As to zeal, I persecuted the church. As far as the righteousness under the law, blameless, but whatever gain I had, I did what? I counted as loss. Because you know what happened? When Paul became a Christian, he lost all of verse 5 and 6. His circumcision meant nothing. It was though he were dead to his peers. His family probably turned their back on him. He had no more friends, no more status among the Jews. He lost it all when he became a Christian. And he makes this statement, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. So what are you afraid of losing? On the other side of what God has for you in this process, things are going to be much better. That's what Paul said. Even though I lost all of these things, the status, the name, the worth, the respect of my peers, I lost it all. But Jesus is so much better. I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. 
there's a phrase at work. I, you know, where I work, there's a lot of military people. Have you ever, have you ever been around the military and you, and you hear the phrase uh, CYA? Does anybody know what it means? Okay. And so there's a lot of CYA that goes on at work, man. You've got to, you've got to document everything. Because if you lose your reputation, I mean, you, you could be laid off, you could be fired, they could find an excuse to move you on, right? And there's a lot of fear in that in people's hearts. And sometimes I catch myself thinking, wait a minute. Am I putting my trust in my CYA or am I putting my trust in God? And what if I lose everything? Maybe what's on the other side of losing everything is going to be so much better with Jesus that I'll be glad I lost everything. That's what he's saying here in Romans chapter 8. He works all things together for good. All things that you might even think are the worst possible thing that could ever happen to you. Even that, he works together for your good. You just don't know it yet. Trust him. Rely upon his sovereignty in your life. Remember 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7? So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of revelations, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord. This was a desperate cry. Paul was suffering. But God spoke to him and said, my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses. I will rejoice in my weaknesses because they keep me small in my own eyes. These weaknesses keep me dependent upon God instead of trusting in myself. And the power of God is so much better. I am happy I lost all of that self-confidence. Going through it wasn't any fun. It hurts. But how much better it is on the other side. We don't think about this anymore. External, uh, excuse me, eternal treasures for temporal losses like we were talking about before. People don't think about heaven. People don't think anymore, this is not my home. I'm going to my home and this place where I am sojourning now is one day going to come under the judgment of God and be destroyed by fire, but God is building for me a home in heaven because Jesus promised. Jesus lost a lot. He was in the form of God. He emptied himself, took the form of a servant, and once he got here in that human form, he then became obedient to the point of death, and it specifies even the death on the cross, even that much pain and suffering. But because of what he suffered here on the earth, in heaven God highly exalted him and gave him a name that is above every name. Do you have the hope today that the righteousness that manifests in your life by the grace of God is laying up for you treasures in heaven? That you have rewards waiting for you? Do you have a hope of a better place, a better home? Do you have a hope of being received before the throne of God and seeing God face to face with the veil being ripped away? Is that your hope, your longing, the passion of your heart to be ready for that? But people don't see that anymore. They don't think that way. They, they don't see beyond the earth that they're living in. And then lastly, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No matter what you're going through, you have the hope that in His sovereignty, God sets the boundary of your every trial and storm. Because that's another fear that we have. What if the pain just gets so bad? What if the problems get so bad that they just completely overwhelm me and I can't, I can't I, I'm overcome? Listen to this promise. No temptation has taken you, but that is common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. That means every problem that comes on 
into your life has a throttle attached to it. It's the God kind of throttle. And no matter how bad it might feel at the moment, God will never let it get so bad that you are overcome and destroyed. So going into every problem, you have that hope, you have the assurance that He provides the way of escape and that you may be able to endure it. And we won't get into this because we're out of time, but the way of escape that He provides is Himself. There is, he is the way of escape. When you go to Him in prayer and He gives you grace and strength to not only survive but to overcome the storm, that's the way of escape. When Jesus came up against His biggest trial of the cross, what did He do? He went to Gethsemane and prayed. And He said, He told His disciples, this is how you get through the problems in your life. Pray. Because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Are you facing a mountain? Are you facing a tragedy? Are you facing a crisis crisis today? Pray. That's the way of escape. That's where you find your strength. That's where you find your hope. That's where God speaks to you. And he provides the power that you need. Father, we thank you for your sovereignty. We thank you that you truly are in control. Help us to remember that. Help us to remember that that you are the way of escape. I can run to you and find the strength and the hope and the joy to endure whatever I have to endure. Father, we worship you today and we surrender our lives to you. Keep us safe and bring us back tonight to worship you again. Father, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.